Welcome to the first of six Aston Magna programs this year, featuring music composed between 1609 and 1825. Our other concerts can be accessed through the Aston Magna website. We are dedicating this season to the memory of a longtime board member, Stephen Perlman, who brought resourcefulness, joy, and a love of early music to our board meetings and to our concerts. Today's concert features early music for the forte piano and violin. Keyboardist Sylvia Berry joins me, playing a copy of a piano made by Anton Walter in 1795. The copy was made by Chris Mana of Belgium in 1995. I am playing a copy of a Guarneri violin from 1747, the copy by Douglas Cox of Vermont, 2008 and I'm using my John Dodd bow from about 1800. Historically, the collaboration between keyboard and stringed instruments had rather fitful beginnings. In the early history of solo violin music, beginning in about 1600, keyboard instruments, that is harpsichord or organ, most often played an accompanying role as continual instruments, improvising harmony over a prescribed baseline foundation, accompanying the violinist's flights of fancy, which themselves were only partially written down. There was at the same time, to be sure, a flowering of music composed for solo keyboard, but virtually no music for a keyboard and a string instrument together on equal footing. One of the earliest composers to write for the duo in an even-handed way where both keyboard and violin parts were both explicitly prescribed and equal in weight, was J.S. Bach, who composed six sonatas for harpsichord and violin. Even here one might perceive a bit of an imbalance, for given the nature of both the instruments and of Bach's acrobatic mind, many of the movements of these duos are really trios, the two hands of the keyboardist realizing two independent voices and the violin a third. A hybrid musical form was born in the mid-1700s, that of the accompanied keyboard sonata. The two sonatas you just heard by Johann Schobert and Josef Bologna are of this type. In the Schobert especially, the violin part either doubles or makes discreet comments on the elaborate keyboard part, Schobert, and the keyboard part being primarily the primary voice. Schobert was a harpsichordist after all. One could even imagine this sonata performed creditably without the violin, though it would be a bit poorer for it and I would be out of work. This shape-shifting of musical forms didn't just happen on its own. It came about in part because of the peculiarities of musicians' personalities, and perhaps even more so because of the rise and fall of certain instrument types. In the early 1700s, a newfangled keyboard instrument was invented in Italy by Bartolomeo Cristofori, and an enthusiastic advocate aptly called it the Gravi Cembalo col Piano e Forte, meaning a harpsichord with soft and loud. It became known familiarly as the Piano e Forte, or the Pianoforte, and also the Forte Piano, one wonders if this latter nickname wasn't coined by some alpha type. For us today, it's simply called the piano, rather incongruously, I might add, as the modern piano is a good deal louder than its ancestors. The rather slow emergence of the forte piano during the 1700s was partly explained by the sophistication of its complicated delicate mechanism, and therefore the difficulty in manufacturing it in large numbers. The traditional harpsichord is sounded rather simply when a key is depressed, activating a plectrum that plucks an intended string. The player has virtually no control over its volume. In contrast, on the forte piano, each string is struck with its own small dedicated hammer, and the player can control the velocity of the hammer stroke with his or her touch on the keyboard, thus varying the volume. It can play loud, soft, and everything in between. Here I might digress and add that, like Aston Magna's other keyboardists, 
Sylvia Berry, my colleague today, plays harpsichord, organ, and forte piano. She is therefore a string player, a wind player, and a percussionist. The harpsichord, with its large and impressive repertoire, hung on for quite a while before being eclipsed by the forte piano in the mid to late 18th century. Although, of course, the older instrument has had a fascinating resurgence in the 20th century. For a while, the early piano and the harpsichord coexisted in the mid 1700s. And in fact, a good deal of music was published for the harpsichord or pianoforte. Publishers not wishing to miss out on sales, of course. Johann Schobert, whose D minor sonata was first heard on the program, was a virtuoso harpsichordist. His many sonatas were explicitly composed with a harpsichord in mind, though the forte piano was already lurking in the wings, and one imagines Schobert wouldn't have objected to his sonatas being purchased by a forte pianist. There were even a few instruments made that combined the two mechanisms. They had two keyboards, one of which plucked and one which hammered the same set of strings. But making and maintaining such an instrument was not worth the trouble, apparently, and the expressive powers of the pianoforte or forte piano prevailed. Joseph Bologna was a virtuoso violinist, and in his duo sonatas, the violin have a bit more of an independence than Schobert's. And it would be, the violin would be sorely missed, I think, if it were not there, though the keyboard still has the bulk of the work. However, in the Mozart and Beethoven sonatas offered tonight after this talk, the instruments, despite their obvious difference in size, construction, methods of sound production, and in their musical personae, are treated with a kind of radical equality resulting in real dialogue. There were fascinating personal links and musical influences among the four composers we play tonight. A middle-aged Schobert encountered the prodigy Mozart in Paris and had a demonstrable influence on the seven-year-old. About a decade later, we have good reason to believe that Mozart met Bologna as they lived in the same building for a while. And we know that the teenage Beethoven revered and traveled to play for the mature Mozart, mature meaning 31. Very little is known of Johann Schobert's life. He was born in Silesia around 1720 and moved to France as a young professional. It was in Paris that he composed, published, and performed, and where he died in 1767, alas, from poison mushrooms. Schobert wrote several sonatas for solo harpsichord, but many more for harpsichord with an accompanying instrument, usually violin. Mozart's early sonatas, in fact, his very first published works, printed in Paris when he was eight, were accompanied keyboard sonatas and were no doubt influenced by people like Schobert, J.C. Bach, and others. But over his lifetime, Mozart's many duo sonatas describe a progression towards a truly even-handed dialogue. Beethoven took this practice and pushed the give-and-take rhetoric even further. One can trace this metamorphosis of roles in the program tonight. In Schobert's D minor sonata, and to a lesser extent in the sonata by Bologna, the keyboard is clearly favored with the foreground. Mozart's melancholy E minor sonata begins with a haunting unison, followed by a remarkable shared discourse of great urgency. And Beethoven's pastoral spring sonata is an even-handed collaboration typical of Beethoven's chamber music and much of the sonata literature that followed it. Mozart was seven years old and his sister 12 when the father Leopold Mozart took the family on a grand tour of Germany, Belgium, France, England, Holland, and Switzerland. His purpose was partly to educate his gifted children and partly to show them off and thereby give them a leg up in the struggle of a musician to survive in the unstable world of the 18th century. In Paris, where they stayed for five months, they met a number of musicians and noblemen, including Johann Schobert, who was reportedly offended when told that the Mozart children could play his music with ease. However, he seems to have had a positive effect on the young Mozart, who paraphrased music from Schobert's harpsichord sonatas 
in his own second piano concerto, K39. Mozart was 11 years old when he wrote that and often used others' music at this point for inspiration. <clears throat> Dianne Hussey, the British music critic and Mozart biographer, has suggested that Schobert's fiery harpsichord writing and playing had a hand in Mozart's dramatic compositional development. And the Mozart scholar Alfred Einstein indirectly corroborated this when he wrote that Schobert's music had all the grace and invention of his European colleagues, but also trod, showed true passion, seriousness, and fatalism. As you heard, these qualities are there in abundance in the outer movements of the D minor sonata. Joseph Bologna was born in 1745 in Guadeloupe, the French colony in the Caribbean. He was the son of a French plantation owner and one of his wife's African slaves. His father took the seven-year-old Joseph to France for a formal education, where he excelled in, among other things, music and swordsmanship. Despite the racial animus from various quarters, he was made an officer in the King's Bodyguard Corps at the age of 21, at which point he adopted the suffix of his father's title, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. He was an outstanding violinist and led concerts in Paris to much acclaim. He composed concertos, sonatas, chamber music, and even comic operas. He was also involved in abolitionist efforts in both France and England. In 1789, when the revolution declared equal rights for all French, Saint-Georges embraced the new laws by joining the Revolutionary Army. For a while, he led an all-black regiment, which became known as Les Jeans Saint-Georges. But he fell afoul of zealous and perhaps jealous adversaries for occasionally engaging in non-revolutionary activities, such as musical events. He was dismissed and imprisoned for 18 months. This may have saved him from the guillotine during the excesses that followed the excesses that followed the infamous terror uh, after the revolution, in which former revolutionaries turned on each other. He lived amidst various other intrigues and died in 1799 at the age of 44. As you heard, his violin sonata that we just performed is a gallant, untroubled affair reflecting the musical culture and tastes of Paris well before the turbulent years of the revolution. There is no documentary proof that Bologna and Mozart met, but they lived, as I said, together in the same building in Paris for a while in 1778. Earlier that year, the 22-year-old Mozart and his mother had arrived in Paris from Salzburg. He was attempting to revive the reputation he had inspired 15 years earlier as a prodigy and to establish himself professionally in the French musical capital. His father had insisted that his mother chaperone him despite her frailty. She became seriously ill during that cold Parisian spring and despite Mozart's attempt to minister to him, including finding a doctor she trusted, her health declined rapidly and she died several months after their arrival in Paris. Mozart remained in Paris for another two months before returning home to Salzburg, not having attained a post or even prospects of one. During his time in Paris, it is not known if it was before or after his mother's demise, Mozart composed two sonatas in a minor key, one for solo piano and one for violin and piano. The A minor solo piano sonata is almost harsh in the turbulence of its outer movements, though the central movement offers temporary relief. Of his 18 solo piano sonatas, this is one of only two in a minor key. And of his 36 sonatas for piano and violin, the two-movement E minor sonata that we will play next on this program is the only sonata in a minor key. In contrast to the piano sonata, A minor piano sonata, it features an austere textural bareness quite untypical of his other duo sonatas, and it is unrelenting in its sadness. Though there is a brief, serene mirage of an oasis in E major in the midst of the second movement, 
but the message overall is mournful, even existential, if I may slip in a post-enlightenment concept. Both moments end in anger, perhaps at fate. If I may quote the Mozart scholar Alfred Einstein once more, he calls this E minor, e minor sonata one of the miracles among Mozart's works. It springs from the most profound depths of emotion and goes beyond the alternating dialogue style to knock at the gates of the great world of drama, which Beethoven was to fling wide open. And so we end our program with Beethoven, though the sonata we offer tonight is not of the stormy or melancholy type. It is Beethoven in pastoral mode, in F major, the key of his sunny sixth and eighth symphonies, and two of his spirited piano sonatas. It has been called the Spring Sonata, though the nickname was not Beethoven's. However, it is not inappropriate. Of his 10 violin sonatas, it is perhaps the most often played. The four movements are in sunny major keys, and their predominant moods, respectively, are mellifluous, soulful, boisterous, and songful. Perfect summer music. Thank you for joining us.